I just want to first and foremost thank y'all for all that you did. It was amazing how many backpacks we ended up with. We were going to set a goal, and we didn't set a goal, and the Lord set a goal, and we did 301. Uh, last year we did 70-something, I think it was. Uh, I just asked a few people to speak that had gone with us and gone to the Shel Shelby backpacking and what they'd done here and what all happened here. Uh, I was not able to be here for the packing. I was in Jamaica on a trip, but uh, Donna's going to speak first, and then the three amigos will have them come up. <laughs> Untell what's coming out of that, but we'll get them up here. <laughs> Go ahead. We can have pictures now. Or, but first of all, let me just give some uh, numbers before the pictures start of uh, the goals. First of all, when I walked in down in Shelby and seen this mound of backpacks, whew, was I blown away. 4,300 backpacks. And if you can only imagine that, I thought, man, we'll be here for two days. <laughs> but we wasn't because we had such diligent people working together. There had to be at least 150 maybe 200 people there working. Everything was, there's this lady got up, she told us all that was gonna happen. It was very, very organized. And uh, everybody had a, a, a job. And uh, everybody did what they were supposed to when it went smooth. And from the time we took a bag and went through it, and it went, right on and right on to the truck. So, um, and of course, first of all, it did start here at Gracie Creek in Barry's Chapel. Is that the two churches in the county? And uh, so, of course, here we went through them. And, well, we put in what's supposed to. And as you can see, there's the mound of uh, backpacks. And you can see why I was shocked when I walked in that door, because I had no idea it was gonna be this kind of numbers. But it was wonderful. We had a great time, lots of fun, and uh, you know, just uh, just a blessing. And each time that I tried, uh, maybe not every bag, but every time I got a bag, and if I wasn't talking, of course, you know how that is, I'd try to say a little prayer over each bag, and just asking God to bless the child that would receive it. And that maybe something would stick with them. Maybe not now, but down the road that they would remember that they had received a bag. And uh, in these bags, we had a piece of, uh, two or three pieces of clothing, a complete hygiene bag, a um, toy, um, goodness, what all, a cans of food. And a Bible was in every bag. It did not leave there. If they was something was missing, we had people like little Hayden. We ran that child to death. Uh, he would run and get it. They had people that was at tables that there was things there that uh, uh, they they would give you to put in it. It was it was so organized. And if it hadn't have been, we would have been there probably for two days getting those bags done. But anyway, the numbers was <clears throat> 4,300 at Shelby, and the state of North Carolina's uh, goals was 16,000. We collected 17,531 bags. <laughs> and then as we were sitting at lunch, we had a great uh, lunch, uh, it was a soup meal, and it was so good. The ladies done a great job on that. And as I sat in there, we was talking to some gentlemen, me and Sandy was, and between the state of North Carolina and two other states, there was 80,000 backpacks went to be distributed in the north, and that was in the Appalachian coal fields and probably some other places. Okay. I mean, I... I just couldn't believe 80,000 backpacks. And they were nice things in these backpacks. It wasn't junk, it was nice things. 
I was very impressed, and uh, um, I just loved it. Had a great time. I didn't go on to Virginia with them, but I know if you couldn't tear up from what you just seen, if your heart was not touched and you couldn't tear, there's something wrong. Because that, that touched my heart to see those children, you know, betraying the story of Jesus. And uh, I just... It's just so impressive to know that you're helping a child that's in need. And, uh, and of course, you know, just loving them and know that they're loved. Uh, so I don't know how many more pictures we've got, but <laughs> we're about the end. But uh, I guess one of the funniest things that went on, um, you know, I was great. I was growing up right in the backwoods of the con this country and uh, of course well, I grew up with spam and treat and stuff like that but I don't remember eating too much of it but I know we had it but anyway me and Crystal was working side by side and when we got a couple of bags that had that in it <laughs> I said oh my lord surely we're not going to send this up there and Crystal said I said I don't think these kids would eat that and she said well, they would eat it. I ate it. And I said, well, you know, I remember it, but I don't remember eating it too much. But I'm sure I did because I ate what was on the table. But we had the most fun uh, just, you know, doing all this stuff. And uh, it, it was a great time. So, you know, if you didn't get to go this year and you can go next year, you know, it'll be worth your time and effort. And uh, it was a good time. So thank you all. I appreciate the church and what they did in collecting the bags and uh, just appreciate y'all. Oh, me. <laughs> Uh, you just got to, it's hard to explain the feeling that you get with these kids. They just scrooch up to you wanting love. Just, they just want to be loved on, and they're so happy to get these book bags. And it's just a blessing. You get a chance, you need to go. Uh, me and Pam and Elaine, Luke thought we went down the road <laughs> to, <laughs> to see this rock. But really, we slipped off and went to McDonald's. <laughs> he didn't know that till just now. <laughs> but they do feed us good up, I really, they do. But we was having leftovers from lunch, and we decided we wanted a Big Mac, so we slipped off. <laughs> you weren't supposed to tell that. <laughs> oh, yeah, Pam, I'm trying to get oh. the... The air mattress, the air out of it. That was a that was a treat. Yeah, you've seen the picture on up, up there. there. It was. <laughs> and thank to Brenda Watson for letting us have our mattresses or we'd have had to sleep on them little bitty mattresses. So it was a lot better this year than last about sleeping. <laughs> Did you say anything else? No, I'm good. It's your turn. I can just say that you really don't know these women unless you share an eight by 10 room with them. But, but we honestly had the best time. And as you can see, the sweetest children. Uh, and they were so appreciative. Uh, they didn't care what was in the backpack. They could barely hold them up on their back, but they were, they were so happy to get them. And it's a blessing. It's just truly a blessing. And if you've ever thought about going, don't wait another year. <laughs> go the next next year. Go. Because the children receive, receive a blessing, but goodness, you receive the biggest blessing ever. We, we did, we had fun, and <laughs> we did some crazy things, but we, but really and truly, the children make your heart just want to beat out of your chest. It's so sweet. 
of what I thought about was the middle aged, middle school children, bigger children. They were thrilled to death with their hygiene bags. How many of y'all would love to get that for Christmas? They were just, and the little ones were so, they wanted to talk to you, I mean anything. And one little girl came up to me and she said, what's your name? I said, Elaine, never heard that before. And she turned to Judy and said, what's your name? <laughs> and they just, they just want to interact with you. And it's a wonderful trip. Thank you. The, talking about the hygiene bags, uh, that's what one of the teachers came back to us. And it's the simple things that we don't, we take for granted every single day. I asked Hayden, I said, you want to sing in the choir or talk? And he said, I think I'll sing. But he said, if I was up there, I'd say, uh, those little bitty kids, to, they'd just break into that bag and they'd see a toothbrush and toothpaste and just vibrate, just shake all over. Just being so happy to have a toothbrush and toothpaste. And, you, know, you get that in your stock and you dump that out. And you, what else is in here? We take too much for granted in our life. Uh, I, I can't thank y'all enough for being obedient to God this year. It, that's all it was this year is being obedience. For what it was able to be done, we collected 700 and, 700 and some, or 600 and some, and we needed 700 and some to go up there. So we were able to fill the quote at Shelby. But, but during that play, that teacher, I said, I've got to see that teacher. And I said, thank you so much for being obedient to the Lord and doing this. And she said, it, she said it was the kids. It was 100% the kids picking that out. I don't know that our kids around here do that. And I, I'm thankful for David's church and David's great wisdom and guidance into this. And of course, Arnold called me this year and said, well, there's another school. I said, let's do it. Ain't no need in thinking about it. Let's do it. So we went to a new school this year. And this year, I, I got to go in and hand the bags out. Most of the time, I'm on trailer counting and nervous as a shot cat out there thinking, Lord, if you, I know you've got it, but... We're running short here, Lord. And last year he showed up and loaves and fish, and we put more back on the trailer and we sent in. Well, this year is David's daughter. I let her do the counting. Well, she was all two pieces two or three times. Daddy didn't hear. He said, God's got this. He'd say, Let me Luke. I said, Yeah, he's got it. But you can't you can't explain, there's no words saying how it affects these kids' lives. And they see you. They saw, some of us saw us last year, and I remember you, and I remember a whole lot of the kids. I remember some of the special ones. I think I'd have been on that. A lot of them would have remembered me if they came back. Uh, there's a lot of those kids that you can't forget. But seeing those little kids not being able to carry it out, and the teacher have to carry it for them, they're so little, and it hanging off her back, dragging the floor, and they're about to fall over, but... This whole thing just boils down to, and I said this whenever I did the presentation on how to pack and all that stuff. It's Matthew chapter 25, verse 35, I was hungry and yet you f gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. That's what we're doing. And it ain't just up there now. People say all the time to me, they say, well, you, you just got back from Jamaica. What do you do around here? You know, don't you do anything here? It's supposed to start in church. Well, no, it's supposed to start outside these doors. We're supposed to go outside these doors. We're too comfortable today sitting in here on a pew. And in Isaiah 6, 8, it says, here am I. Peggy read this and did a devotion on it up in Vermont for us. Those who go, that is us saying, here am I. We've all got a duty from the minute you're saved. We've got, we got a need in this community. And we think that the law is supposed to take care of it. This week we got to, five or six of us, we got to go through some tests and trials. We saw things that 
You wouldn't be shaking my hand this morning. You wouldn't have been shaking none of our hands, even though we had gloves stuff on. For the stuff that we've waded through this week, it's about five, I guess about six of us. But whenever God calls you to do something, He's going to lay a hedge of protection over you. Said what, somebody said, well, you're crazy, you're stupid for doing this. I said, no. You, yeah, it's the law's job to protect us. But whenever it comes down to it, there's no change to be made unless it's Jesus Christ comes into their heart. And how are they to see Jesus unless they see Him through us? We're His hands and feet. And this week we're His hands and feet wading through needles, dirty needles, drugs. Nathan may want to share this, but upstairs in that house, it wasn't Sean living there. It was another people living there. We're blessed to have a toilet. But laying amongst all these bottles of you can imagine what? Laying all around her bed. There's, bless God, there's a baby's blanket sitting there and shoes. And a woman laying there pregnant in that bed. And you can say it's her choice or whatever. But bless God if they don't know the difference. If they're not shown the light. Whenever I walked in that house Monday morning, this is far off from the backpacks, but it's all the same. It's a mission that this church has been called to. I walked into that house Monday morning. The windows blacked out, black sheets over them, demons hanging on the walls, devil heads with horns in them, drugs laying on the couch. I walked in there. I ain't never had a feeling like that in my life to be nervous or scared going into a place, but I was there. And this is where somebody lived. Within walking distance, seven, seven and a half minutes from right here, and a man walked here. He tried to do it on his own, but God jerked the rug out from under me last time where we backslid. He's drying out right now. And we're able to go in there and help him. We're repainting his house. We had to throw the man's life in a trash bag. But for him to start over. But we have to give him a, a guidance. We have to be the light. But I went in there and I ripped off the curtains off those covering those windows. Bless God, whenever the light comes in, that's whenever it has to, the darkness has to flee. Those demons had to flee. Wherever you walk in that door today, there ain't nothing but the feeling of the Lord wherever you walk in there, as much as wherever you walk in this church, for much we prayed over that house this week. But this is supposed to be about backpacks, and that got thrown. That's right. It's all about God. A whole lot of us got a whole lot closer to Him this week. But we have such a great time up there in Virginia, and I'm torn between over here, and I'm going to let Nathan take the rest of this for over here, but the back, I couldn't help but lay that in there because the church is going to start a new mission. It's going to be here. It's going to be dirty. We're going to be showing God to some people. We're going to be showing the light of Jesus to some people, and that's what we do up there in Virginia. Uh, we have a greatest time up there after handing them out. I mean, you come home and you've got, kind of like this week, I've emotions poured all over you of every kinds and every sorts, but we, you come out there and you sit in that church and we start playing games and a whole bunch of us and you learn a whole lot about a whole lot of people. And that bus driver we got around here, <laughs> whoo, he's ruthless, ruthless. You know, we found out a little bit about him going to Carowinds, but, you know, he'll ride anything that there is. Well, it's got wheels or not, upside down, wherever. But, but you get to playing games with Gary, and that man gets serious. He broke, broke one of Pam's fingernails, I think, during a game of spoons, and I think slapped Elaine or something like that, hit her hand. And, but you find out a lot of people, but uh, those three people over there that just were up here a minute ago, we... Uh, you know, you always have troubled people whenever you go on a trip. You got that one person or group of people or whatever that are always going to cause trouble. And Gene knows all too much about that. This year is the older ones. Those old ones we had to call down and say, all right, we're trying to get to sleep. Now, hush that giggling in there while there's like on one of those bouncy things you throw out in the middle of the lake where one person lands on this side and it shoots that person off. Well, that's what's happening with our air mattresses in there. But I. We're going to start taking up again.
for backpacks, anything, anytime. The toothbrushes are taken care of this year, 100% of them. But we've got a room set aside up here to put stuff in. Uh, probably starting February, I think, or so, we're going to start putting line item in the, in the bulletin every, every week for stuff for that month to collect and so that it's not all at one time. And we'll find out which works better. I think all at one time works better for this church. It's it piled in here in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we need a lot of prayers here in the next little bit as we go into this. Sean needs a lot of prayers. Virginia needs a lot of prayers. All this does. But I told, I told Nathan, I said, I didn't want to get in the flesh and get up here and get in the flesh. But Nathan, you've... You come on. Say what you say what the Lord's laid on your heart. Thank you. If you've got a Bible, turn to Luke chapter fourteen and Luke chapter fifteen. I know I just heard some sighs of oh my, but I promise you I'm not going to take a lot of time. There, there's one, there's one word. There's one word that. Um, And, and truthfully, um, I guess you could say you could, the verses of Scripture I'm going to read to you this morning, you'll be able to see where these words are coming from. But do you know why our church took up over 300 backpacks? I think we roughly needed 750 I think it was something like that, 750, 760. Do you know, Crystal? 758. I was thinking, do you know why we took up almost 300? You were willing and you were obedient. Do you know why this past week we had six men, seven men, a group of men that were willing to go into a place that uh, that's not for everybody? I, I mean, listen, here, here is where I, you know, not every ministry is for everybody. Uh, uh, but everybody plays a part. Um, was told this week about how much we were covered in prayer. Didn't really realize how much we were covered in prayer till I started getting word about how much we were covered in prayer. Those backpacks were covered in prayer. And let me tell you something, okay? Um, I saw something this week that really opened my eyes to something, to the importance of putting a Bible in a backpack. Okay. Um, this week we were in that upper room at, that, that Luke was telling you about, and I mean, it was covered with all kinds of stuff. It's just what we'll say. We'll just say stuff. Protect integrity and dignity. It's full of stuff. And I was good. I was gritting my teeth behind my mask, and I was doing what needed to be done. But at the end of two mattresses, there was a little two-seater couch. Right in the middle of that two-seater couch was a pair of shoes that were the exact same size of Lydas. Little pink blanket, little purple blanket, coloring crayons, coloring books. And on that couch was a Bible. Cleaning in one of the rooms, I picked up a mattress in between the mattress and box springs where you could reach under and grab it real easy and pull it out was a Bible. And as I went thumbing through that Bible, there were dirty fingerprints on every page. Now, you may say, preacher, why are you, why are you bringing this in the backpack ministry? What's that got to do with the backpack ministry? There were Bibles and crayons and coloring books in a backpack. And homes and houses and buildings like we were in this week are all over this country. They're everywhere. It's not just here. You can peel off of them steps outside those glass doors and you can walk to where we were in seven, seven and a half minutes, depending on traffic, depending on, depending on your pace. But you can make it in seven minutes with a 15-pound backpack on your back, kind of taking your time but having a purpose in your walk. You, you know there's a difference there. Seven minutes from here. 
seven minutes that are lit that is literally underneath the steeple, there was a child that was living for whatever purpose, for whatever reason, they were there. You got to be willing, and we have to be obedient. Willing, willing to do things that people are going to say, you're stupid. Don't you think that Peter, James, and John, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, when they left their fishing business and went to follow a teacher that was absolutely different than everybody else outside the realm of what they were used to going to, don't you think that some of them thought you boys are stupid? You boys are foolish. Why are you leaving a successful fishing ministry to follow this teacher? We have to be willing. We have to be obedient. Luke chapter 14 verse 23. I've read this. I preach this. It's about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is the prophetic emphasis here. But there's the verse of scripture that I'm interested in is verse 23 where it says... And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. If the Lord called us to go to the highways, we'd be a little bit more apt to do that, wouldn't we? Because, I mean, you think about it right out here. I'll turn out at the bottom of the road. You'll turn out at the bottom of the road. There's three lanes of paved pavement. Good open road, you can see both ways, there's no, there's no dangers, there's no problems. But when you get into the hedges, you start getting off the beaten path. You start getting into places where it's not necessarily uh, as convenient or as comfortable to go to. I, I wish I could stay, stand up here and tell you that every time God's called me to the mission field somewhere, I've been like, woohoo, let's go Jesus. There's been more times than not I've said, you, are you sure? Why don't we just talk about this a little bit more? There's been other things that I would rather do. There's been more comfortable, more convenient things it would be. And can I just go right ahead and tell you, when I get into verse fifteen or chapter 15 here in just a second, I'm going to point out something. It's easy to be Christ-like in here today. I mean, the biggest complaint we got in here is how long is the service and how hot or how cold the sanctuary is. Yeah, y'all afraid to say amen, but I hear it. I hear it. Preacher, we went past 12 o'clock. Yes, we did. I'm glad he didn't have a time frame when he was on Calvary. I'm glad he's dealt with me and dealt with me and dealt with me and dealt with me and dealt with me time and time and time again. Chapter 15 is the parable of lost things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. But in the parable of the lost sheep, I, I'm, I'm not as interested with the sheep because they were lost. It was lost. That one, he left a hundred to go find the one. But, but I'm more interested in the shepherd. Because notice what it said. A man who having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost. Here's the phrase, until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. Now hold up. Wait, 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 wait. Right there. Layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. He doesn't take a cattle broad, prod and try to get it. He doesn't take that shepherd's staff and poke it. He, the, the Bible doesn't even say he even talked ugly to it. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever come back to the Lord and him talk ugly to you? Have you ever been lost in the wilderness because of foolishness as a sheep? Came back to church. Who talked the ugliest to you? Probably church people. Some of y'all wide-eyed because I said that, but it's truth. Holy Spirit welcomes us in. The Lord has open, hand, open arms. But you and I often as church people toss judgmental glances, have whispering conversations, we discuss things. Now let me tell you a story. Probably before Gracie was born, so probably longer than 12 years ago, there was a group of boys that I met while I was at 
working at P&R Grocery. They were underage, and I wouldn't sell them cigarettes. And they got mad. And so they took mayonnaise and went down the side of my pickup truck. The Lord saved me at a young age, but there's still a tendency for the flesh to well up in me. Don't mess with my wife, don't mess with my children, and don't mess with my pickup truck. Now back then, back then I didn't have a wife or children, I just had a pickup truck. So you know where my emphasis was. So the next day, them boys come in snickering and laughing, and I took the key out of the register and locked the door and went and sat down. And I said, boys, I know what you did. Kind of fast forward, I, I told them, I said, boys, look, you're not worth me having to pay a fine if I get caught for selling. Un uh, get your daddy to come in. I don't care what he does. Get somebody to come in. It's of age. I'll sell them. They give them to you in the parking lot. None of my business. You don't need to smoke anyway. But I told them, I said, boys, if you touch my truck again, you better hope that the Lord has your soul because I'm going to have you. That's what I told them. Three or four of them boys come back in there the next day, tears in their face, and they apologized to me and they said, thank you for caring about us enough to set us down and tell us what's right or wrong. And one of them said, we actually thought we'd wait till you got off work because we thought maybe four of us could take you. And I said, boys, I don't fight fair at all. So it wouldn't have what Dunyon's any good. And they laughed. One of, fast forward down the road. Those same boys are hooked on drugs in this county. I bury one of their friends, stand over him, and I beg them to get out of drugs and alcohol, beg them to stay away from that. A week later, one of those same young men who was the one who actually put the mayonnaise on my pickup truck was intubated, overdosed, nobody knew what they had taken, and was laying in a hospital bed in Newland. Not long after that, I get a phone call. It was on homecoming. First Sunday in August, get a phone call, sheriff's deputy. Preacher, we know that you're ministering to these young boys. We know that you've been talking to them. One of them, they're taking him by ambulance. He's unresponsive. Don't know how long he's been out, but I know he means a lot to you, and you're trying to reach out to him. All right, now this is the third time. You get this? I didn't put a time, I didn't put a, a limit how many times I'd go to this young man. This is the third time. When I walk into the emergency room, he's his feet and his hands are tied to the gurney. And he's jerking. He's convulsing. Nurse looks at me and says, we don't know if he's going to make it. I laid on top of this young man. I don't, want any, I don't want you to think, oh, what a preacher we've got. Let me tell you something. I wanted to whoop him. I wanted to whoop him. But I laid down across his body and I said, Lord Jesus, please. Please. So he's in ICU and I'm sitting there and I'm talking to his stepdaddy and his stepdaddy's involved in law enforcement. And I said, what can we do about this drug program, this drug problem that we have? What can be done? I preached this a long time ago. At the, I preached and made, made reference to this a long time ago at the Mitchell Baptist Association. And nobody liked what I had to say that day. And now probably some of y'all are not going to like what I've got to say right now. But I'm going to be obedient to what the Lord is leading me to say to you. Because I believe that Grassy Creek Baptist Church has a great opportunity to be, if we're willing and obedient, to see God do some things in our county that... Nobody has seen yet to date. But I asked that man, what can we do? I was thinking, man, we need to fund something. Let's pour some money. And he looked at me and he said, every time we make an arrest in law enforcement, every, every T's got to be crossed, every, die's gotta, every I's got to be dotted, everything's got to be done exactly right, or it's thrown out on a technicality and nothing happens. He said, I'm regulated by the laws of man. I'm regulated by the court system. He said, I can't do things that I want to do. And he looked at me with tears streaming down his face with his stepson unconscious, intubated in an ICU room. And he looked at me and he said, but nobody can keep the Holy Ghost out. I was dumbfounded. Yes, I knew that. Yes, I knew that. Yes, that was not. So. But I said, what are you talking about? He said, if churches would stop judging and start praying. 
if churches would come together and find where there's drug houses and start begging God to do something. He said, you cannot regulate the Holy Ghost. He has no boundaries. You can't stop Him. And He said, I am a Christian. And He said, our side is always victorious over the other side. And the other side's using drugs and alcohol and, and sexual addictions. And He said, why don't we, as God's people, come together and start praying and and covering this in prayer. And he said then man can't regulate what's happening. <laughs> Tuesday I was standing in the middle of a room shoveling. And I put that, that, that shovel up against that wall. And I said this is foolish. And done. Luke and I had been talking about how we needed some music, how we needed some mu something in there to make the atmosphere a little bit better. And I, I mean, listen, your imagination will run wild and you start putting stuff in a trash can, you start shoveling stuff up, and you start piecing together what's been happening inside of this building. That's why I say it ain't for everybody. <laughs> but I throwed, that, I throwed that shovel up against that wall and I put my hands in my pocket and I said, we just need to make... Some phone calls. This place just needs to be condemned, tore down, go on. And I looked up my stand in front of a dresser. Big mirror. Skulls all the way around the sides of it. And the Lord whispered in my ear and he said, And he tells me to do the same thing to you every morning. But there is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So let me tell you what I did. I started crying. I started praying. I started throwing skulls away. Me and Luke had talked about it. Probably wasn't their job to do it. But you know what? Sometimes somebody needs to take the initiative. So I started chunking. And then I remembered that on my phone, there is the song, Raise a Hallelujah. And I set it on top of that dresser and I cranked it up and I just started weeping. And let me tell you something. You know why that song is powerful in the case we're in? Because I don't know if you remember it or not, but the service we had where we played that at the invitation, the young man living in that house stepped out in that aisle right there and had his hands raised and was weeping came to the altar and was weeping uncontrollably and he stood up and he said I don't know why I'm supposed to be up here but I can feel it in me dragging me here he left that day and he called and he checked himself into a facility to dry himself out and then he got to the place where it was just too much and too overwhelming for him and so he thought it was hopeless and so now God has laid him on his back and let us walk in and now things are changing but we've got to be willing and we've got to be obedient and we've got to be willing to go look <laughs> we've got to be willing to say when it was when he brought those shepherd would bring those sheep in it was safe in that sheepfold. It was comfortable. Inside that sheepfold. They were together. Inside that sheepfold. But when he went to going down through that. Now look. I want you, you don't have to look around. But I want, you to, I want you to think about. Who should be on this pew close to you today. But they're not for whatever reason. Maybe a daughter. Maybe a son. Maybe a, maybe a husband. Maybe a wife. Maybe a family member. That should be here. But for some reason they're not. And they have left the sheepfold. And they're lost out there in the wilderness. Are we going to be willing and obedient to go get them? <laughs> Tuesday night I was taking a shower. And it hit me how blessed I am. When I took my clothes and I could smell those clothes just where I had been. But I was able to put on new clothes. And I began to take a shower and I began to just talk to the Lord. And to be honest with you, there was so much emotion that goes on, you know, 
frustration, aggravation. I, can I tell you, I was scared to death. I was scared to death that come Sunday morning, y'all was going to have a vote of confidence. You was going to shit me out of here because of some of that. And you still might after tonight's business meeting. You might want to be here just to see. The Lord says it's easy to sit in here on Sunday morning. It's real easy to come to your jubilees and your, your meetings. It's real easy to come to your Sunday school class. It's real easy to come to BSF. It's real easy to come to that sort of thing. But when you are compelled into the highways and the hedges, it's not easy. It's not comfortable. It's not convenient. It's hard. 2020, we're asking the Lord to allow us to see Him bigger and to see Him clear. While we were all in and out of that house, we were all talking about ministry and, and uh, the questions been asked, where are we going to next? And this sort of thing, got some leadership from the Holy Spirit is from the direction to take next when we get, get one thing done. Because, I mean, listen, I mean, that's what we're called to do. We're called to be his hands. We're called to be his feet. And you may, you, may not, you may not be able, you may not feel like you can go in and do some of the things that's been done. But you know what? You can pray for us. You can pray for who? You can pray for, you can pray for the bus drivers. He's driving the bus to trips like Virginia. You can, you can pray for the workers who are working in places like that. You can pray for safety. You, you can maybe, maybe provide financially. There was a heater that was bought and, and, and d different things. I mean, there's always, Corinthians tells us there's one body but many members. I broke my toe one time. And let me tell you something, you don't think you need it till it's broke. And when it ain't there, when it's not there, you realize it. I broke my pinky, and you wouldn't think you really need a pinky. But, I mean, when I couldn't use it, 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 really, it really magnified the need for it. But are we going to be willing or are we going to be obedient? I, I, want, to read, I want to read something. Miss, Miss Peggy, if you'll come play something. I, I feel like a couple of things. And, and back to the backpacks, we are going to kind of split it up and start taking uh, because... As it's towards the end of the year, we don't want to we don't want to pile up too much on the back end with doing the uh, our own Christmas project here and ministering to folks and 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 the the world mission offering and then uh, the backpacks all in the last three four months of the year. I, I mean, kind of we don't want to overload us, so we're going to try to spread it out. Pay attention to the bulletin. Starting in February, there'll be something about buy loads of it. All right, the more of it you bring in, the more backpacks we're able to do. All right. There's a song, and I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read the chorus twice and the verse one verse. It's by Brandon Heath. I know you probably heard it, but here's how it starts. This is the chorus. Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. Step out on the busy street, see a girl and her eyes meet. Does her best to smile at me to hide what's underneath. There's a man to her right. Black suit and a bright red tie. Too ashamed to tell his wife he's out of work. He's buying time. All these people going somewhere. Why have I never cared? Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted. The ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. You know, coming up in the year, we're going to look at that we can see things from the way he sees them. See people the way he sees people. See the church the way that he sees the church. This morning, I, I, as she plays, I, I just want to ask you this. Are you willing to say, Lord, I want to be willing and obedient, so help my heart. So that I can play my part, whatever it may be. Whatever I can do. As you stand this morning, just for a little bit, would you be... And 
would you be willing to come up and say, Lord, I want you to lead our church to Virginia backpacks. I want to, to ministries that are, gonna, that are really going to make a difference, to uh, reaching out to somebody who is overwhelmed by, by addiction and overwhelmed with situations in life. Maybe, Lord, make me willing to see what you want seen and to do what you want done. Help me to be willing and help me to be obedient. Those of you that are afraid to be the first ones out, they some already in the altar, so you can just come on. But we be willing to play your part, whatever it may be, however it may be, and just say, I, I'm willing to do it. Let's do 